Hello and welcome to the Tough Girl Podcast, which is all about motivating and inspiring you. I'm your host, Sarah Williams. Today, we're going to be speaking to Selena McCall, who was also a competitor at the Marathon de Saves this year in April 2016. Hi, Selena. How are you? I'm very good, Sarah. Thank you for taking the time to interview me today. Oh, no, it's awesome. Now, do you just want to tell our listeners where you're sat at the moment? I'm actually sitting um, in my uh, office at home in Singapore. So it's it's the evening with me. I'm looking outside into complete darkness. And you've just asked me to switch off my air con. So I'm going to be sweating in about five minutes. <laughs> I was just about to bring that up. I think it's so funny. <laughs> I'm taking you back to the desert. <laughs> you have, you have. <laughs> oh, but do you know what would be amazing for you? Is if you could just, I'd love to hear more about your background. So if you could just maybe tell yeah. our listeners just a little bit more about you and who you are. Yeah, sure. So listen, um, I'll, I'll get straight to the point. I'm a 43-year-old married mother of two. I've got two boys aged five and seven. As I said, I'm living in Singapore at the minute. I'm working out here um, and have been for the past five years for a global investment bank. I, I work in their, their real estate, corporate real estate team. And so, um, as I said, I've been out here for five years now, about to return to the UK and um, got into running, I would say, probably about, gosh, 13 years ago, but but I'm not a sporty person at all. Uh, I think as most mothers or working mothers, I tend to be trying to juggle numerous things at any one time. And and running is, I guess, one of those easy sports that you can, um, you can just pull on your trainers and go and run outside and, and you're immediately into your exercise. So it's a very time efficient way of, of managing your exercise. Oh, absolutely. So what was it about? Was it was it turning 30, the reason you started <laughs> running? <laughs> yeah, it probably was. Actually, I was living in London at the time. And of course, the London Marathon is such a big deal. And um, when you live in London, you sort of get into the whole London Marathon fever every year. And so I'd applied a few years in a row and through the lottery. And I knew that on your fifth attempt, you would automatically get a place through the ballot. Um, and on the fourth attempt, I was um, thinking, OK, so it's my fourth year. I'll get it next year so in the meantime I'll sign up for the Paris Marathon just to try that so um, signed up with a good friend of mine and um, obviously got a place in Paris and then two weeks later got a place in the London Marathon um, and I was like oh flip you know Paris and London are literally two weeks apart but I thought given I finally got my London space and I've got a Paris one I'll just have to do both so um, yeah I took up running seriously at the age of 30 because I really hadn't done much up until then and then literally I ran two marathons within two weeks of each other. Oh, and um, how was that? Which, yes, it was a great experience. Both marathons are, are fantastic. Paris is a beautiful marathon. Um, you know, the streets are gorgeous. The scenery is beautiful. The French are hilarious. You know, you get to about a kilometre 30 and they're handing out wine and cake <laughs> and things. So um, really funny. But isn't it they're really good experiences? And, you know, I, um, I was doing it for charity as a lot of people do and I can remember some guys at work saying to me if you run London faster than Paris we'll double the amount of money we give you so um, I thought okay that's a nice little challenge for charity so um, I ran Paris in 339 and two weeks later I ran London in 334 so I was pretty chuffed with myself um, for managing to to run a bit faster two weeks later so yeah that was my introduction to running. Absolutely fantastic. I love that. You've already got two big challenges of running two marathons, but we'll make it even more challenging. That's right. That's right. Yeah, we like a wee challenge every now and then, don't we? Oh, no, that's fantastic. Now, you mentioned about um, raising money for charity. And what was that charity? Um, so at the time, it was actually Cancer Research UK. So, you know, I guess that's obviously one of the big charities that people raise for. We all know somebody who's been affected by cancer. And it was just, um, you know, one that I thought, you know, resonates with people. It resonated with me. Um, and, uh, and it, you know, it, it was very different to the charities, I guess, that I've been raising money for recently. Because I would say over the past five years working in Singapore, I've, my, my charitable focus has definitely started to lean more towards women's charities. Um, and, and that has sort of been born out of, in part, um, my uh, my work. So at work, I co-chair our women's network. And so I've had the opportunity to get to know a lot more about women's causes, both in the workplace and, you know, around the world. And and I was also um, I was also recommended a book called Half the Sky a few years ago by, um, it was actually by my physio at the time. And 
And, you know, I was really shocked by what I read in there about how, you know, half the world's population is effectively so discriminated against. And um, and it really made me think long and hard about the very cushy life that I have and, and what privileges I have grown up with in terms of just things that we take for granted, the freedom of education, the freedom of, you know, being able to have dreams, pursue dreams and, and nobody to ever tell me that I couldn't do that. Um, and that's not the case for, for a lot of women around the world. So, um Recently with MDS, obviously, I, I definitely um, decided I wanted to focus my efforts on raising money for women's charities. Um, yeah, so different different angle. <laughs> no, no, absolutely. And I think it's so important. Now, I know that you were raising money for a charity called Women for Women International. It's actually a charity mm-hmm. that I was involved in. Back, oh, really? Yeah, back when I was in London, I became a sponsor and I did a few did videos okay? about, um, about why you should sponsor women. But I don't know, do you just want to share a little more about Women for Women International and what it is. Yeah, sure. So Women for Women International is a charity that works with women survivors of war and helps them rebuild their lives in um, eight different countries around the world, like Afghanistan or Iraq, Kosovo, um, Democratic Republic of Congo, Bosnia and Herzegovina, etc. So um, what it does is it puts women through a year long course where they learn vocational skills, they learn um, how to manage money, they learn a bit more about their own rights. And um, at the end of that year, it it has equipped them with the ability to restart their lives, rebuild their lives. They've got a skill, they know what what business they might want to get involved in. Um, And they just know, yes, I said a lot more about their rights and education and and healthcare Um, and so it really just empowers them by providing education it empowers them to um to improve their lives and to um to provide hope for them for their for their families and for them and you know it's, it's something I feel really passionate about because you know all of the the data tells us that if you educate a woman then she obviously can not only help decrease poverty um, within her own family but within her local community she's going to spend her money on nutrition medicine housing and um, her children will be healthier and 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 for every dollar a woman earns she'll spend 80 cents on her family whereas men tend to spend it on um, tend to spend only about 30 cents in the dollar um, on their families so you know for women there is a much greater impact of educating them and empowering them and enabling them to earn their own money absolutely I think it's a fantastic charity and I will be sharing the link in the show notes thank you but perfect but the marathon de Sabs, now it yeah. does attract all sorts and everyone has a <laughs> variety of reasons for wanting to run the race and it's one of my always favorite questions is to ask people you know a 43 year old like you said a 43 year old married <laughs> mother of two obviously incredibly passionate <laughs> about raising funds for women for women international which is amazing but why did you want to do the mds challenge what was it about it yeah, listen, I actually had heard about the race over 10 years ago and um, there were a couple of guys at the company I previously worked for who had tried to get me to join up with them as part of a team and run, but the timing just wasn't really right for me. And, and you know, we always knew, my husband and I always knew that we would stay in Singapore, Singapore for about five years and obviously the conditions here are much more suitable for training than the conditions are in the UK. So obviously you're living in temperatures of over 30 degrees all year round. Um, so that in and of itself is going to be an advantage. Um, and I just thought being able to live here right now, um, we also have the benefit, as many people do in Singapore, of having a live-in helper. So obviously she can help, you know, manage a lot of um, our domestic duties. So um, again, I've got a bit more time than perhaps I would have in the UK. Um, also just recognise that the older I get, the more I reflect on the fact that I don't want to be lying on my deathbed thinking, oh, you know, I'd love to run the MDS and why didn't I take time to do some of the things that I really have been dreaming about doing? So um I just thought, you know what, what am I waiting for? Why am I sitting here just dreaming about this and never actually getting on with doing it? And I I thought, you know, I want to inspire my kids um, to believe that, um, you know, that they can pursue their dreams. And and I I also um, volunteer with a local charity in Singapore called Ida, which provides uh, financial education to foreign domestic workers like, like our helpers. 
And I wanted them to believe as well that it's possible to have crazy dreams. Um, and if you have crazy dreams, you just need to put in place a plan and execute the plan. So it's, it's dreams are free. Let's turn them into reality. And and so I guess those were some of the key reasons. I'd say one other thing would be um, I've just always been interested in human resilience and, and what you can do if you truly put your mind to it. And I often reflect on, for example, the women who are impacted through Women for Women International and how people actually go through a war situation and are um, they somehow find the strength to get through really difficult situations. And, you know, we're lucky enough to not have been in a situation like that. But I, I was really interested in pursuing my mental resilience as well as my physical resilience um, and see how I got on and something that people claim is one of the toughest food races out there. So, so yeah, many reasons, many, many reasons. reasons. So how much time did you give yourself to prepare? I actually signed up... Um, I give myself about 11 months to train. So, you know, a long time. I actually created a registration link in about January of last year. And I remember going through the UK site, creating a registration link and, and sitting looking at it and thinking, I can't press submit. I'm too scared to press submit because I know this is going to be really tough and I know it's going to take an awful lot of time. And how on earth am I going to find the time to, to train for something like this? And um, I can remember then going... Every, every couple of weeks, I would go back onto the site and check the link and think, oh, God, just press submit and not quite having the courage to do it because, yeah, because I was frightened. <laughs> and then one night I went in and it was about 11 o'clock at night. As it usually is when I'm doing crazy things like this. And I looked online and um, I thought, you know what, I'm just going to do it. And I, pr- I tried to press submit and it, there, were no, there were no places left that wouldn't let me submit. <laughs> and I can remember just feeling sick. And thinking, oh, my goodness, I have just missed, you know, a window of opportunity in my life, which was a perfect window of opportunity to do this race. And so I went, you know, rushed into the bedroom and spoke to my husband, Derek. I said, Derek, I need to do MDS and and I can't get signed on. And I just really want to do MDS. What am I going to do? And and of course, he was half asleep at the time and he was, you know, dazed and confused by what his mad wife was waking him up to discuss and in his um in his half sleepy mind he agreed that it was fine for me to sign up to MDS even though you know for the past 10 years he's told me it's a completely ludicrous thing to do and so I immediately ran back to the computer and searched every site I could to find a way to get into MDS and 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 I went through the French site in the end and I think probably because I lived in Singapore as well that perhaps helped because obviously there's such a broad range of nationalities involved in the race and so I managed to get a place and um and yeah, that was it then. I committed myself. So um, so I gave myself 11 months and, and I thought, you know, I'm only going to do this once. I'm never doing this race again because I know it's, well, it's expensive for a start and, and it's very time consuming. So I signed up and I thought, right, 11 months to get myself, to get myself ready. But obviously I've never done anything like this before as a lot of us haven't like yourself, you know, when you signed up for MDS. And so I thought I need to get myself a good trainer. I need to get myself an expert who can help me in this because Bef- I am. Um, go on. No, I was, Sorry. Gonna, no, I was going to say, before we go on to sort of getting, getting the trainer and speaking to the expert yeah, and stuff, yeah. I'd love just yeah. to go back and just talk about yeah. pressing that submit button uh, because uh-huh. it's the... <laughs> It's the courage yeah. that it actually takes to sometimes to, alive, yeah. to take that yeah. final step. And yeah. you obviously, I mean, I think what's really interesting in your case is you press the button and then suddenly it was like opportunity missed. You know, you're, you're yeah. not, not going to get a right. place. So you've, yeah. almost, right. you've gone through that challenge of you know, yeah. pressing the button, psyching yourself up for it, doing it, yeah. and then almost... Yeah, like, yeah exactly. And it's, it's funny because you read so much after MDS or so much online about, you know, taking on challenges and, you know, and as they say, you know, if it, if it doesn't scare you, it's not going to change you or it's not really a challenge. You know, if it's, you know, if it's a really, if it really scares you, you know, it's an enormous challenge and you are likely to be stretched and grow through that, which is why I probably had taken so long to go, ah, oh, can I press submit or not? I don't know if I can. Um, and then you don't realize how much you want something typically until you can't have it. And, and that was definitely the case when I pressed submit and I couldn't get on. And I was, I was devastated. You know, I just sat there looking at it going, I feel sick now. 
because do, but yeah, do, do, I can't you know, get on. do you know what's interesting <laughs> is that actually at that point you actually had to, you yeah. had a choice. You could either say, "Oh well, that's it." Yeah, you know, like yeah. you know, everything happens for a reason. I've missed out. Maybe I'll do it next year, whatever. Yeah. But you actually said, "No, I'm going to find a way." And That's I like right. the fact that you took action to make this. Yeah. Happen. So, right. got your place for the MDS. You've got this <laughs> eleven months to plan, to train, to get yourself That's prepared. Right. And like yeah. you said, you know, you, you'd only started running when you're in, in your in your thirties. You've never completed yeah. anything like this before. You're a working mother. Yeah. You've got two children. How do you go about preparing for a race like the MDS? <laughs> I know. Well, listen, um, I, um, I, 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 I I view myself as actually being quite male in some respects in my in my my mentality. So. F- for example, with shopping, I will shop twice a year for clothes. I hate shopping. It's just a complete waste of time. So when I shop, I go into my favorite shop. I stand in the changing room and I say, I'm here to buy clothes. These are the things I like. I'll be in the changing room. Just bring me in clothes. And then I spend a silly amount of money. And then I don't need to be shopping for clothes for another for another six months. And so similarly with MDS, you know, I don't have time to get things wrong. I don't have time to experiment. So I am happy, therefore, to pay an expert to tell me exactly what to do, to tell me exactly what kit I need, and I will follow those instructions and I will execute the plan. And so so that was as simple as my strategy was. So um, I did a quick Google search and I came up with R- Rory Coleman's name kept coming up. And, you know, as anybody who's involved in MDS knows, he has he trains hundreds of people for MDS. That's his job. And is crazy enough to have run it 13 times himself. Um, so I thought, you know what, this guy probably knows something about this race. So um, I will contact him um, and see if he can help me. Um, and I think one of the other things actually to, to just reflect on was I was not running a lot at the beginning of 2015 so I was running probably 20 to 30 minutes a day and in fact when I moved out to Singapore five years ago I actually stopped running for three years because it was too hot you know so the irony of you know them going and deciding you're going to run in the Sahara Desert but yeah so I didn't run for about three years and then I was literally running 20 to 30 minutes a day and uh, then decided I was going to do this crazy challenge. So anyway, I got in touch with Rory and he developed a training plan for me. And of course, Rory's based in Wales in the UK and I'm based in Singapore. So Skype became our main means of contact. And um, and he developed a training plan for me that worked around my work schedule and around my um, my travel schedule with work. And yeah, I just got stuck into the training and I followed his plan and... Uh, he said, listen, there are three things you need to focus on. You need to focus on, obviously, your training, do the training, lose weight, and make sure that your kit doesn't weigh too much. So those were his three pieces of advice. And, yeah, I, I, I followed his plan. And, yeah, 11 months later, ran the race. <laughs> but how, how was that training period? I mean, I went through stages where I was just thinking, oh, I'm sort of like, I think I'm overrunning. Mm. I never want to put my backpack yeah. on again. I've yeah. Just, you know, you have like you have these low days, and it can be really oh, yeah. difficult sometimes to force yourself out there. And and obviously, you know, yeah. you've got you've got family, you've got children, mm. you've got a job. How yeah. how how did you fit it all in? Yeah, I mean, it listened. Uh, discipline, uh, I think, was a word that um, a lot of people would apply to it. And you know, I'm, I'm incredibly disciplined about things if I seriously want to do them. And so, you know, I, you, you're right, you, you don't find the time to train for a race like the Marathon to Sadly, you have to make the time. Um, and I'd say first and foremost, I have got an incredible husband, who, despite not being 100% convinced that doing this race was a good idea. And in fact, having, you know, who will deny all recollection of having agreed to me doing this race. He, you know, he was he was incredibly supportive insofar as he would take on a lot of the burden with the kids. I did try to make sure that my training minimised the impact on the family. So that would mean you know, I'd make sure I'd go to bed early and I would get up early to go and train. So 
you know, during the week, it was pretty common for me to be waking up at half five in the morning. I'd go out for a run for two hours. I'd be back by 7.30 in the morning to get the kids up and out of bed and ready for school, put them on the school bus by 8.30 and then either do another hour or two of training before going into work or I would um, or I'd, I'd just be going straight into work depending on the day. Um, my work, I, I'm, as I said, I'm based in Singapore. A lot of my work is actually based in India. So my day tends to be skewed towards the latter end of the day. So, you know, I have a lot of evening calls but my mornings are quite are quite free and this my, my my boss was super supportive he was very accommodating of me being flexible about coming in a bit later on certain mornings um so that I could fit in my training and I, I would basically do six days of, of training with my my training week starting on a Friday and going through to Monday being heavy training Tuesday being you know maybe only an hour long run Wednesday being another heavy morning and Thursday being an off day and so I would say probably within a couple of weeks I was running going from running like 20-30 minutes a day to running 26 miles a week and then by Christmas it was up to 100 100 miles a week on a, on a heavy endurance week um, and, and again my training went in three week cycles so it was you know it was it was hard obviously to, to fit it all in but you know I loved it I really loved it I loved it was me time you know, and I think, you know, as mothers and as, as women, you know, we don't often permission ourselves to have me time. And I, I can remember being at a conference, a women's conference a couple of years ago and hearing um, a woman give some advice to the women in the audience and say, you know, as, as working mums, many of us will often feel guilty about spending time on ourselves and will equally feel resentful of the fact that everybody is taking every hour of our day. And so I, my advice to you is to permission yourself to do one thing for yourself every single day and I resolved that mine would be running um running for me was was me time it was a means of releasing stress from work or stress from just daily life and um I felt if I got it out over and done with first thing in the morning it wouldn't be hanging over my head all day and equally I would not be getting annoyed about people then filling the rest of my day and not giving me the time to go out running. Yeah, absolutely. What did your children make of it all? Like, did they understand <laughs> about the race? And... Bless the wee souls. They had to become runners too. <laughs> so they, um, listen, in, in Singapore, there are loads of, of, of fun runs for kids and family runs. There's a lot of outdoor activity because obviously of the weather. And um, so we really got into a lot of family fun runs. So, you know, Every couple of months, we'd have signed ourselves up for a fun run and the kids would be running, you know, either, a, you know, one or two kilometer race or even up to a five and a half kilometer race. And, you know, my, my seven year old really is into it. You know, he's, he's a good little runner. He's very um, tough. He's um, he's got a lot of stamina. Um, and, you know, so he'll go out for a 5K run with me. It will not stop. Um, you know, he's determined that he's going to run well. So he, he really gets it. The, the five year old you know, when we bring him out for a run, he complains, oh, this is the worst day ever, you know. <laughs> oh, I can't believe we're having to go out for a run. So, you know, for him, it's, it's definitely not as exciting, but they do get it. Um, in fact, their school has been incredibly supportive of my fundraising efforts and indeed did the race itself. And so I've actually been in to talk to all the kids at the school about the race and um, why I was doing it, what I was doing to prepare for it. And, and so, of course, they got super proud about that. And then the school was tracking my progress throughout the race. And, and, and funnily enough, you know, when I got back from the race and obviously was talking to my kids about it, they now talk about when they're going to do MDS, not if they're going to do MDS, which I just love because they think it's absolutely normal for people to run MDS, which is brilliant. I think it is absolutely brilliant because it is, you're there, you're being this role model, you're inspiring your children, you're inspiring, yeah. you know, all the school friends, the people you work with, obviously all the money that you're raising for Women for Women International is absolutely fantastic. Now, yeah. there are a lot of rumours about the race and, you know, it's billed as the toughest <laughs> foot race on earth. And yeah. and I think before, before the race, there can be a lot of fears that you can have. What scared mm. you most about the MDS before you got over there? Or what were you worrying about? Um, listen, probably I was worried um, most about things like food. Um, and, you know, I had tried the race food before and I knew that I 
didn't love race food. And as you and I both know, race food means dehydrated food that you're going to rehydrate and therefore is never going to taste fantastic. You know, energy bars, energy gels, high calorie, low gram food that just isn't going to taste brilliant. And I had, when I'd done some training runs before, I had, you know, like a five days of 20 miles a day on race food. I mean, just I, by the end of the five days, I was feeling wretched. And so that was something I, I wasn't looking forward to. I think the other thing, as many people fear, was the long day. Because very few people run double marathons, you know, <laughs> two marathons back to back. And certainly I hadn't done that in training. So I was I, I, that was probably the thing that I feared the most the day four. You've already had three days of racing and then you're going into a double marathon and I was really worried about that and how I would get on on that. How did you deal with that sort of that worry and that anxiety? How did you keep yourself sort of calm before the race? Mm. Listen, I, I went into the race knowing I was well prepared. So again, you know, I had followed the plan. So I'd followed an expert's guidance on how to get through the race and how to prepare for the race so and you know when I met up with Rory last summer in Wales he um he put me in a treadmill and he he said okay I want you to run in this treadmill at 15 kilometers an hour for 15 minutes I remember looking at him thinking you're absolutely bonkers I cannot run for 15 minutes on a treadmill at 15 kilometers an hour that is just insane and he said you can you're just limiting yourself so he put me in the treadmill he refused to obviously let me switch the treadmill on he stood right next to me and wouldn't let me touch any of the buttons and he made me run for 15 minutes at 15 kilometers an hour and I did it now I was wrecked obviously at the end of the 15 minutes but his point was very simple to me which was you are the per- the only person who is not believing what you're capable of you are hampering your own ability to perform in your mind so just believe that you can do this and you can and I believe you have the capability to do well in this race and in fact it was last summer that he said to me if you follow the plan if you 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 know do the training if you lose some weight and if you keep your kit as light as possible I believe you can be in the top 10 women and so he set this he sort of like created the dream for me and then it was just a matter of me trying to fulfill that dream and uh, as I said you know I I was never sporty at school you know I've not been I've never excelled in sport and so for someone to actually say I've trained a lot of people and I believe you can do well it's quite powerful and I think that was something that I found really motivational both in my training but also throughout the race when you get people believing in you and believing that you actually are better than you yourself think you are it's an incredibly motivating factor um, and can help you excel beyond your own beliefs. Absolutely. I, 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 I so believe that as well because mm. it, it's so strange. You do People do just limit themselves and think about what they can and can't do. And mm. they, whereas actually sometimes all you need is somebody else to say, I yeah. believe in you. I know you can right. do this. You, you, That's right. Yeah. So somebody tell you, you could end up being in the top 10 women Wow, yeah. like that's that's exciting yeah. and scary. That's right. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, listen, I didn't tell too many people that, obviously, because I didn't want to embarrass myself <laughs> if I couldn't do it. <laughs> but yeah, but I always had it as a secret, sort of like a secret dream. Yeah. Thinking, you know, okay, so if I go to MDS, like imagine if I'm in the top 10 women, that'd be so amazing. And obviously, as, as you'll recall, like, the first day was pretty miserable. <laughs> were, you know, the, the first day of the race, my heavens, those headwinds were nasty and you're running 34 kilometers with like a lot of sand dunes like really steep sand dunes and a headwind and I had no idea how I was going to do that day obviously because I didn't know the field I didn't know any of the runners you know I'd read a bit online about how the field was pretty good this year but I'm sure they say that every year and so I went in really not knowing how I was going to do and at the end of the day when I realized I was actually 11th woman I was like wow actually he might be right. I actually stand the chance of being in the top 10 women. That's that's pretty cool. And and so that then became a real driving force and motivating force for me to continue to really push myself for the rest of the week. Absolutely. Now, what was, did you have a race strategy where you 
yeah what, what, <laughs> yeah what was the race strategy apart from just keep keeping in the top, top yeah. 10 women it was really simple it was really really simple and it's funny because I, I noted in MDS that not everybody had a race strategy which on reflection was a bit bizarre to me not that I had thought a lot about my race strategy but it was really really simple and it was run everything except the uphill bits it, it was that simple so and I used to repeat a mantra in my head run if you can walk if you need to run if you can walk if you need to and so I knew you know I would start every morning as we all did with that highway to hell music blasting and and everybody would be like a bat out of hell you know it was just everybody would like race off in the morning and I'd be like oh man alive what are you what are you guys all doing you know slow down you can't keep that up and and so I'd be constantly checking my my Garmin that I was on a pace that I wanted to run which was slow and steady and you know I would equally be mindful of how many women I would see overtaking me so I would just keep an eye on okay so that's like whatever 15 women are ahead of me now I, I know that over the course of today I therefore need to catch up a certain number of women so it really was that simple slow and steady I, I kept thinking to myself you know the tortoise and the hare you know I was <laughs> reminding myself of the children's story I'm the tortoise um, and I will gradually and slowly overtake the hares that have gone out and that will end up having to walk at some stage and I will do my Sahara shuffle um, for as long as I can and, and keep it really slow and steady. Now, now throughout the race you will have had incredible high points but also I imagine a low, a low point or a yeah. some, some point that challenged you either yeah. physically or mentally can you can you yeah. recall that 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 point yeah definitely there were probably two days the one was obviously in the long day I mean everybody knows the long day is going to be miserable and um and that day the faster runners obviously start dear love them three hours after the rest of us so um the top five women and the top 50 men start three hours behind everybody else so there are a lot of people that you might normally be sort of running with that you're then familiar with and on that day it's slightly out of sync so I, I wasn't sure how I was positioning that day which was a bit unsettling so I felt a bit down because of that and I knew it was a long day ahead and so when I got to checkpoint three, I asked the volunteers who are giving you the water, you know, how am I doing? You know, what what number woman am I? And they said, you're number three, which meant that I was number eight because obviously there were the, fat, the, the top five behind me who hadn't started yet. And that really gave me gave me the motivation that I needed to, um, to keep running and to keep running strong. Obviously, later in the day, it was it was pretty tough. I put on music to, to keep myself going. And I, and I reflected a lot on, you know, the words of encouragement that I got, the emails that you get throughout the week from friends and family telling you, you're doing great. You know, you're a superstar. Can't believe how well you're doing. You can do this. And you're you're reflecting on all of that and thinking, you know, I can do this. It's fine. Keep going. And I, and I honestly could feel like the power of positive thinking helping push me through, which was which was amazing to actually be in that zone where, it's all spiritual you're um you're you know in your own world you know repeating mantras to yourself praying singing um and, and pushing yourself forward willing yourself to keep going and yeah that was that was, that was a tough day it was a long day as we all know and I finished after um, 12 hours 25 minutes I finally got in and and I was sick um, as a lot of people are throughout the week as well you know so I was I was vomiting and feeling pretty rubbish at the end of that day and and that then was the start of when I just couldn't get my food down anymore um the rest day I struggled eating and, and on the final marathon day um I, I just was really struggling with food and that day was a a horrible day for me because you know I vomited throughout you know the race the medics stopped me to check me understandably and, and I lost a lot of time in the process of um having to walk to a checkpoint where they then you know check my blood pressure and, and and my temperature and then said I could I could run again and and I was very conscious that it was the last race day I'd worked really hard and the last thing I wanted was to lose my top 10 women place I was so focused on not losing that space and thinking you know this is the race it's not a training run you gotta keep going it's the last day push yourself through and I reflected just on, on the fact that in war times 
there's so many people have to flee their countries with no food in their stomach, with, you know, as much of their life belongings and small children on their backs as possible. So, you know, quite frankly, if I couldn't run a marathon on an empty stomach, feeling a bit ropey, then I wasn't a particularly strong person. So, uh, you know, it was just thoughts like that, that kept me going and, and really pushed me through. Oh, God, absolutely. I think it's it's so true. Sometimes you've just got to realise that actually, you've made a choice to be there to, yeah, to, to right. do to do this race and actually you were right. pushing yourself mentally and physically some people out there don't have a choice they are they are fleeing their country exactly. they don't have food in their yeah. stomachs they're That's like right. you say they're carrying their children on their backs yeah and they're still going for it so that's right yeah now i'm gonna have to ask you because my feet <laughs> i have to say in comparison to some <sighs> people's feet were like beautiful with my three little tiny blisters, <laughs> I like a few little blisters on the heel. My feet were just, I was so, so lucky or you know, very, very well prepared. How did your feet end up? Were they okay? You, are you telling me you had three blisters? <laughs> yeah, really small oh, ones. Oh, you jammy <laughs> dodger. Oh, my goodness. Here's the irony. I didn't think about my feet before I went into that race and I know you read a lot about taking good care of your feet and things but I never have problems with my feet like never I've run nine marathons in in the past in my training I ran uh what was it 2,379 miles or something crazy like that I never get a blister my feet were wrecked on empty <laughs> absolutely wrecked um by the end of day one I could feel the blisters coming so I started taping them up end of day two I was like oh my goodness I'm gonna have to go to the dock trotters and I can remember peeling off my the tape off my feet and my nails lifting up and thinking <laughs> oh no I can't believe this and bless the dock trotters I mean my goodness what they have to deal with I'm sure it turns their stomach but I spent about an hour in the dock trotters um with the poor soul dealing with my feet and of course I was like back there a couple of days later and and then my heel got an infection and of course you know one of the mandatory kit items is this tincture of benzene antiseptic and I can remember on the rest day being so exhausted that um I couldn't even pick up the energy to go to the dock trotter so I thought I'm gonna I'm gonna self-medicate my feet and I can remember pouring the tincture of benzene on my heel which had had multiple blisters on it and literally swearing the loudest I think I've sworn in my life with the pain of 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 my heel and um ultimately you know I found out a couple of days later obviously when we got back to Wazazat and um we were in the hotel and got back to the dock trotters that I had you know quite a quite a deep infection in my heel but yeah it's healed beautifully now I've lost six toenails which isn't a disaster but yeah my feet were not for public viewing for a number of weeks after the race (laughs) so challenges aside I mean I think your race sounds incredibly different from mine you know, <laughs> with the, the feet, the losing, the toenails, the vomiting, yeah. you know, the, the pushing on yeah. through. And you've, you've obviously had all these challenging situations, but there must have been a race high, whether that was crossing the finish line or somewhere else during the race. What was the highlight for the race for you? Which Is there a particular moment that just stands out? Oh, it's a really good question. Um, and I remember, you just listen, I've listened to your podcast, obviously, in the race as well. And I can remember you saying, and, 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 and it just resonated with me, that the finish is almost a bit of a letdown. You you cross the finish line and you know that you're going to have to do the solidarity stage the next day before you can get your medal. So you think that the highlight is going to be the, the finish of the race, but it's not. Listen, I would say, actually, the, the finishing the first couple of stages of, of the race you know those first couple of days were probably highlights for me because I was finishing and I was feeling pretty strong and pretty good and thinking actually this is my goal is achievable I'm feeling pretty positive um I think I can place in the top 10 and you know I'm feeling pretty good about this I also felt you know listen I felt good at the end of the the double marathon day even though I was sick I felt such a sense of accomplishment for having been able to run a double marathon in the Sahara Desert you know so so that was a highlight as well and I'd say the other one was just a moment of reflection 
I can't remember, I think it was probably the second day when we were crossing some of those beautiful sand dunes, which were very high up. And I can remember going, you know, being on top of one of them and thinking, this is the sand dune that's in all of those MDS trailers that you watch. I'm on that sand dune now. This is what I've been watching online for like the past year. And I'm on this sand dune now and just thinking, wow, this is cool. This is really, really cool. What is now it's been a few weeks since the MDS and obviously you've had yeah. some more time to reflect and the rose tinted glass has yeah. come out will you be racing the MDS again <laughs> no no <I> will not. <laughs> listen um my husband seriously thought I was having a midlife crisis when I signed up for this race and and you know he after the race he's been and during the race in fact he was incredibly supportive beforehand you know he did wonder what on earth I'd signed myself up for and he was saying you know listen seriously do not sign up for something like this again this is you know it's incredibly stressful for everybody you're actually doing this since I've completed it you know he's really he would have he would sign me up again like for next year you know he's like super supportive now and saying listen you know he's googling all of these ultra marathons and saying you know have you seen the course time in this I think you could actually win this you know why don't you sign up for this and I'm like whoa oh, dude, you know, where's this come from? But listen, I, I think I will, I would like to do some more ultra marathons, but listen, if I went back to do MDS, I know that I would just be pushing myself even harder because I would feel as if I needed to improve upon my position. And overall, I came in the top 100. I was the eighth woman. Listen, I'm chuffed to bits with that. I, that was, I never expected to get any more than that. It was a dream come true. I'm happy with that dream and I'm happy with what I accomplished. I don't feel the need to go back and do that again. Absolutely. Um, I'd like to try some others. Yeah, do some other challenges, but I don't feel the need to do that. Yeah. First British woman. Absolutely awesome. Oh, doing it, doing it for the Brits is amazing. That's oh. right. Flying the flag. <laughs> What do you think, I mean, I, I sort of always ask this question is, what do you think hmm. you learned most about yourself from putting yourself into that challenging situation, hmm. putting yourself into that scary yeah. situation and doing something which is so far yeah. outside of your comfort zone? Yeah, listen, I think the key thing that I learned was that if you are truly passionate about something and you really, really want it, there's nothing to stop you achieving that except yourself. And, you know, MTS was always this scary dream for me, um, something I would always go, oh, wow. If you can grab hold of it, have the courage to press the submit button and then put in place a structured plan to, you know, get the right advice, you know, with a coach, with, you know, whoever, be it, you know, even at work, that's maybe a mentor at work to help you achieve what you want to achieve. If you can find the right support to help you achieve those dreams, then really there's nothing holding you back but yourself. And I think that was probably the greatest learning for me out of the whole experience that actually we are all born equal as babies. We're all born with the same capabilities. Yes, of course, some people get opportunities that other people don't. But if you have the opportunity, then the only thing that is holding you back is yourself. So just if you've got a dream, go grab hold of it and and make it happen. You only get one one chance at life and, and make it worthwhile. No, absolutely. Completely agree with what you're saying there. And I like what you said. It's about those opportunities. Because actually, sometimes yeah. people do miss opportunities, and it's just That's because right. their eyes aren't open and they're not willing to take yeah. to take that risk. But actually, if you can That's go right. for it, put a plan in place, you can go out and yeah. make it happen. Now, you have actually That's written right. um, a few blog posts. Um, do you just want to share yeah. where where they where people can go and read a little bit more about your experiences of the MDS? I've got a few blogs out on the Women for Women International website, so. Um, I've got a few a blog about why did I sign up for MDS? How did I train for MDS? And then what was the experience like post MDS? So three different blogs there. And I guess there's a few online as well with Ida, the other charity that I was fundraising for, the local Singaporean charity. So again, if people do a Google search on Ida, they will see more writings about my uh, about my adventures. No, absolutely fantastic. I think what you're doing is is brilliant. You're being such an inspiration to your children, oh, you. to other women out there, to other working mothers that you can go out and accomplish your your dreams. Selena McCall, thank you so much for coming on the Tough Girl podcast and sharing your story. Thank you. Thanks very much for having me, Sarah. I appreciate it. Too. 
Hi Tribe, how are we all doing? I hope you're having a fantastic week wherever you may be and whatever you are doing. Now has Selena encouraged you and motivated you enough to pick up a pair of trainers or to sign up for a new challenge? If you are looking for more information about running an event such as the Marathon de Saabs, you can check back out a few other of my previous episodes. So you can listen to my episode as I share my journey of getting to the start line of the of the MDS. You can listen to Elizabeth Barnes who was the 2015 winner. She provides loads of tips and loads of advice about her experience of running the MDS. There's also Ali Young, this incredible runner who runs all distances from 800 meters to running 24 hour endurance races. So Ali completed the MDS and again provides lots of information. Now you do not have to go out there and go and run six marathons in six days across the Sahara Desert. I totally get it that it is not everybody's cup of tea and that's a good thing. Everybody is different and that is fantastic but you've got to find your passion what is it that inspires you? What's the fitness or the exercise that you're going to do that's going to get you out of the house, going to get you active? Whether that's ballet, Zumba, netball, trampolining, gymnastics, oh, I'm running out of ideas. But just take a think about what it is that you could be doing. Running is one of those things which is very easy to do. You don't need any kit. All you need is a good pair of trainers and a sports bra and off you go. If you start off by just walking, that is fantastic. Walk, run, walk, run. You can build it up. It's just about trying. It's about getting out there and giving it a go. So a massive thank you to everybody who's been listening to the Tough Girl podcast. I hope you're enjoying it. If you are, I ask you one thing. Please, can you tell one friend, one person, your neighbor, your gardener, your boss, your employees, the person you sit next to on the train every morning or on the bus, just share the Tough Girl person, the pod, yeah, just share the Tough Girl podcast with one other person. That really, really does help the podcast to grow. It helps more people to find out about it. And if you have the time, I would be in so, so grateful if you could write a review in whatever, you, in wherever you listen to it. If you listen to it in iTunes, please do subscribe and leave a review. SoundCloud, Stitcher, again, please leave a review. It means us so much and it also helps other people to find the Tough Girl podcast and to be inspired by these incredible women. I will be with you next Tuesday for another fantastic episode of the Tough Girl podcast. Take care and I'll speak to you soon. <laughs>